I was down with the no way up and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free.
Blessings to you today, my brothers and sisters. What an awesome time to be alive in the kingdom of God. Um, I am in my personal life going through several serious situations of, uh, of family members who are sick and uh, dealing with death within the family, all kind of things. And all of us get a season like that, right? Um, because you're a Christian, you're not exempt from times like that. So God has placed on my heart to give you the message that he gave me as I found myself a little weary and a little shaky under the things I was going through. What shocked me was, as long as I've been preaching the word of God, as long as I have been serving God, which I thought was the best that I could do, you know, sometimes it's not the best that I could do, but when I was continually serving God, I thought that I would be able to handle some situations a little better. You ever been there? Well, I'm going to tell you today, I'm going to talk to you today from this book that you're very familiar with, but you better want, you want to get this truth that God has shared with me as we look at a familiar Bible character in a new light. So uh, let's pray. And we're going to go right into this one. Father God, we thank you again for your divine care. We thank you, Lord, that as we are standing here, let us always, always be cognizant of the fact that you have your hand on us. Oh God, Lord Jehovah, Jehovah God, the, the mighty God, it is good to know that we are under the umbrella of your divine care and comfort. Thank you, God. And tonight I ask that you would, today I ask that you would touch the hearts of your people, that you would bless those who are listening, that you would help them understand, God, that you are already working things out and you are in control, Lord. Bring back to my memory everything that I need to say. But most of all, Holy Spirit, you preach so that the people can hear from you. So we thank you, God, for your presence. Wake someone's spirit up to let them know you hear them. And you will bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. Open up to the book of Ruth. The Old Testament book of Ruth. We are going to read chapter 1, verses 15 um, through, well, I think I'll, I'll read verses 15, 1 through 15. Let's do that. And then chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. All right, so let's go to the book of Ruth. I don't think I want to do 15. I'm going to start at 15. Let's go to 15 and to the end of the chapter. And then let's go to chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. Are you ready? Let's read the book of Ruth, picking up at verse 15 of chapter 1. I'm reading from the King James Version because there is a great understanding uh, of these passages, not too much mystery, so you'll still get it uh, literally and through language. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. Thy God, my God. Where thou diest, will I die. Where thou will be buried, the Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. So they two went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty have dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord had brought me home again 
empty. Man, I feel like stopping right there. Somebody can identify. Understand, she's saying, I started off so in love with God, so full of God. I left out full with his mercy, but then God allowed a series of tragedies to come, and now my life is empty. So I left out full. You ever been there? I, I, I was with God. Everything was fine. Boom. Next thing I know, I'm in a vice or a fight for my life. Verse 21, I went out full, and the Lord had brought me home again empty. And why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabites, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. Can you go to chapter 4 with me? Just a couple of verses, verse 13 through 17, if you'll follow me there. So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. And when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And the woman said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life, and a nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. And he only took the child and laid it in her bosom and became the nurse unto it. And the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi. And they called unto him his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. For as long as the Lord will speak, as long as the Lord will allow, I want you to get this thought deep in your spirit. You have to keep growing stronger. You have to keep getting stronger. Strength is not a luxury. It is a necessity. You have to keep growing stronger. You're going to need it. How do you go from being blessed to being bitter, broken, caught up in self-pity, finding your life cascading down a slippery slope of defeat and finding no way to bring it back. The things that used to bring you joy don't give you joy anymore. The places in God that you used to worship doesn't feel the same. I pray the same prayer. Or I pray with the same fire and I pray with the same desire, but I don't get the same results. How do you get to the point that your life turns into you were blessed, but now you're bitter? How do you go from blessed to bitter? How do you go from being happy and now broken. How do you go from being bitter to being blessed? How do you go from blessed to bitter? You got that. How do you go from being bitter to being blessed? That is the secret of your walk and your journey on this Christian life. There is no one set path. I'm helping somebody already. There's no one set way. Nobody out there is walking continually down the straight path of joy and glory. That's just not true. How do you go from being broken, bitter, to being blessed? What happened? And that's what happened to Naomi that we're going to talk about. See, what I'm saying is, here is an answer to both of those questions. Whether it's being bitter, to being blessed, or whether it's being blessed, and how you stay blessed, is here's the answer. You must keep growing stronger. You have to keep getting stronger. You have to not get to the place where you said, and some Christians have done this, you know, I've arrived, I'm here, I know what I'm doing. I already got the Lord. I used to read every day, but now I don't. You want those kind of Christians to say, I read the word long enough. I don't need any more Bible. I know the Bible. So I don't have to read God's word because I know God's word. Well, the problem with that is, are you kidding me? Do you know God's word is filled with such divine power, with such energy, with such anointing that you can read the same passage, I got a witness, over and over again and yet get a fresh 
set of principles. You get a fresh desire. You get a fresh perspective. How many have read the same passage, but one day it didn't do anything, but the next day it lifted you up? It's because God's word has that ability in it to turn us around. As a matter of fact, it was so important that when Jesus was in the wilderness, listen to what he said. One of the first things he said, Matthew 4, 4, when the devil tricked him into the wilderness, and the devil made him when he was hungry, and the devil said, no, you need to eat. Jesus said, no, no, no. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. I know we have to eat. I'm not crazy. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, but when you get to the importance of what's going to keep you in this life, it is the word of God. Matthew 4, 4. Every word that comes out of God's mouth will bless you. There's somebody out there right now. All you need is a word. It will turn your life around. You need a word. Somebody write that down. You just need a fresh word, and it will bless you. Or you can't ever get to the point where you say, um, I don't have to pray anymore. I've been praying my whole Christian life. I know how to pray. I can pray in any situation. Just wind me up. Send me somewhere and say, pray. Pray for a breakfast. Pray for the opening of service. Pray over somebody's healing. Man, I can pray, 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 pray. So you know what? I don't pray every day now. I just pray when I need it. And the problem with that is that prayer is your only divine connection to God or relationship with God. It is the privilege we have. Can you hear me of sending words to the throne room of God? He sends those blessings back and bless us. If you were to begin praying every time you do it, your heart is right. You open up heaven and God comes down and does something special in your life. How in the world can you? I don't know what enough prayer is, but you can't pray to the point where you say, I don't need to pray anymore. David will tell us this. If you look at Psalms 5 and 3, he said, in the morning, Lord, every day you got to pray. In the morning, Lord, I will lift up my voice. You will hear my voice. I will lay my request up to you, God. In the morning, I will lay my request and wait expectantly. David said, every day I get up, I pray. Can you say that? Can you say every morning when you get up, you pray? Listen to me, that might be the problem. A lot of us are sitting here. Here's what I tell people. You can do a lot of things except pray, but nothing happens until you do pray. And some of you are sitting there wondering why something hasn't happened in your life, but you neglected to pray. Or some of you think, I don't need to praise God anymore. What is wrong with all those folk just jumping around, lifting their hands? I am a little more conservative. I don't do all that praising and lifting to God. I just need to, you know, say my little prayer and know God is able. God don't need all of that jumping. Maybe he doesn't. But you know what he does need? He needs to know that your heart is set on him. And when your heart is set on anything, your emotions line up with your spirit. How are you going to pray from a... That's why when you're in pain, the pain can take over your life. How are you going to pray to God about healing and you're not excited about the healing? So when you praise God, when you glorify God, it opens up something and God comes back down to bless us. And when you look at the Word of God, there's many verses that tell us we need to pray. But prayer... I mean, praise is an essential part to releasing the anointing of God. I'll say it again. Some of you need, all you need to do it. I want you to tell somebody, Pastor Dunn told you to do this. But when you're in your worst pain, I dare you to jump up and down in your bedroom praising God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Sounds crazy, right? But the angels find in and out of God's presence. All they do is praise Him. And when you praise God, it makes us able to endure in all kinds of painful situations. You can't say God is good and the enemy stay on your back. You can't say God is great and the enemy stay with you. You can't say, God, bring me out like you did before. And the devil still grabs you. No, praise is what you need to learn. Because praise will get you to the point every part of your body will be praising God. Psalms 18 and 3 said, I will call upon the Lord, Psalms 18 and 3, who is worthy to be praised. That's what he said. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Prayer. Praise saves us. Prayer. Praise keeps us. Prayer. Praise 
gets us to the point that no matter how bad our life, there's a praise on our lips. So the word and prayer and praise are only a few things that can keep us. But I have a question for you. We need to be prepared by continually growing and keep growing every day. If we know these things will work, why don't we do them more? Let me say it this way. When I was growing up, cartoons were for kids. Everybody with me? We're the cartoon folks like me that understood Saturday morning was for cartoons. It was all what we did. We did our chores and went out there and watched cartoons. There were cartoons out there that were clean, that were family friendly, and now cartoons I see on television, television has broke all the limits of decency. They have all kind of sexual perversion in cartoons, sexual perversion in primetime television. Sexual perversion, all kind of that. And they love to portray these buffoonish satires of church and religion. Trying to, oh, they love to kill the name of God. If you ever watch any of those cartoons, they make the preacher and they make religion seem ridiculous because they're playing into the hand of the enemy. That's not what I was talking about. I'm talking about listening to some of these cartoons that they call adult cartoons. Here's my problem. Cartoons are a medium that mostly kids will look at whether they are adult cartoons or not. But most of the cartoons on prime time have an MA rating, mature audience. Why? Because there's something like Boondocks. I don't ever saw it. Bob's Burgers. I don't know if you ever saw it. If you look at some of these shows, The American Dad, all kinds of horrible acts. They, they, dis, they, they just disrespect parental authority, whatever it is. But when we were growing up, we had adult cartoons. Uh, anybody with me, you know what I'm talking about. You can raise your hand, you know what I'm saying? We had the Flintstones. Came on tonight. We had the Jetsons. I know, I'm going back too far for somebody. But these adult cartoons were family friendly. But there was one cartoon when I was growing up that I loved, and that was Popeye the Sailor Man. Very, very, very popular cartoon. Now, everybody heard of Popeye. So there was Popeye, Brutus, and Oliver. Three characters. Oh, don't forget Wimpy with his hamburgers. But here's how Popeye cartoons went every week. We knew it as we sat in anticipation. First, Popeye and Olive Oil, his girlfriend, would be walking around. Then Brutus would show up and he would begin making eyes at Olive Oil, trying to take Olive Oil away. And then Popeye would rise up and say something and he'd beat Popeye down, kick him all over the place. And since it was cartoons, show him kicking him to the moon and kicking him out and throwing him back and forth. All kind of ways Popeye would get beat up. And while he was sitting there, Brutus would run off with olive oil. Well, olive oil started screaming and all of a sudden, Popeye would reach down in his breast and pull out a can of spinach. And the music changed. So you know Popeye getting ready to tear Brutus up now. Uh, he'd eat it and he'd go there and he'd make a quick work of Brutus. The one thing I used to clap when I was a child, but now that I've become grown and I think about that, I got a $10,000 question. Why did Popeye not take the spinach in the morning every day instead of waiting until he got beat up? Waiting until Brutus had kicked his butt all over the place before he would eat the spinach. I thought about it. I guess it was a format of a cartoon. But I give the same question to you. Why in the world, if you know praying and praising and reading the word of God can keep me strong, why don't you do it? If you know when you first got saved, you memorized, you quoted, you loved scripture, you wrote scripture everywhere, you were strong enough to get a relationship with God, and all of a sudden you stop and you wonder where your relationship is, you don't do it anymore. You don't have those same scriptures on your heart. And now you go further where you need strength and God can don't even read your word. You don't pray like you used to. You never miss prayer meeting. You never miss Bible study. And what I would never, you would never think of missing church. Now you go alone. I know somebody don't like me right now, but stay with me. And then you go through these tragedies that God know are coming, and you're not prepared because you won't keep growing stronger. That's what this text is about today. God is telling me to tell somebody the problem is tragedies are going to come in life. You don't know what's going to befall you tomorrow. You don't know what's coming out of that darkness. You don't know what's coming out of you. And then you fall apart because you're not ready for what's coming at you. And the problem with that is God wants you to be blessed and ready. Paul told the church 
at Thessalonica in the first chapter, verse chapter 3, excuse me, verse 3, he said, no Christian should be moved by these afflictions. We've been appointed unto them. Oh, I got to stop and just let you know something. That what you're dealing with, or I'm going to help somebody, God appointed you to have. But at the same time, God appointed that tragedy. I'm talking to you. The sickness, the problem you were going through, he knew that the path you were going to take, you were going to run into these afflictions. So God said, I'm going to use the afflictions to try to make your life better. So they've been, so he used the word, they've been appointed to you so you can be better. So if God appointed an affliction to me, here is a shout. It's time for you to shout because that means God's going to take this affliction to you. I'll say it again, if God appointed them to me, he's going to keep me while I'm in it, and he's going to bless me to come through it. But we have to get to the point where we understand when we don't keep growing, when we know that it's right, we turn into what the Bible calls a slugger. A slugger, in Proverbs 6, King Solomon said, go thou to the ant, thou slugger. Watch this. He gave us a, a colorful description of an ant. Saying this is a Christian who knows they should be prepared, but they won't get prepared. Here's a saint who knows they should be prepared, but they won't get prepared. He said, go to the ant, thou slugger, consider her ways, and be wise, which having no guide, no one pushing her, no overseer, mm -hmm, or no ruler, prepares her meat in the summer and gets ready for the harvest. Many of you don't realize a harvest will not come till you prepare. Somebody put that in the chat. I need to prepare for my harvest. It will not come until you are prepared, which takes us to what we can learn from Naomi. I gotta hurry, so stay with me. Naomi, this book is about Ruth. Ruth is the center of the book after her name. And many of us know the heroic faith. Many of us know of the providential uh, divine mission God placed Ruth in. And Naomi was there also. So what I want us to do, I'm not taking anything away from Ruth's faithfulness. I'm not taking anything away from what Ruth did. But do you know there's some lessons you can learn from Naomi? There's a whole lot of us who need to get to the faithfulness of Ruth, but there's a lot of us who tragedies have come and left us bitter and hurt. Yep, I know you want to know now. we got to look at Naomi. I'm going to show you some lessons how Naomi started out being bitter in this book. And by the fourth chapter, when I read that chapter, we found out she was calling herself blessed. Somebody's interested right now. I know you would be. How do I go? Listen to her. Get ready to tell you how to bless your house. Bless your children, bless your mind, bless your problems. I'm getting ready to tell you how to bless God to the point that you are excited again about your walk. You get ready to shake some stuff up in your life because I want to tell you what God wants you to know. We're going to show you how Naomi, a bitter, lost, defeated, broken woman, learned how to go from brokenness and bitterness to blessing. Look at the story. Background of the story. I didn't read all of it because it's very connected. It's a flowing colorful, beautiful story about a time. It starts out, the first words in the book gives, you, gives it away. It was during the time of Judges. So we know when the book of Ruth was done. That means, as we all know, it was a time of apostasy. It was a time of unfaithfulness. It was a time when God was selling his people out because of their uh, cyclic actions of sin. He was sending them back into the place of the enemy. I don't have time to preach on that. Please tell me you understand. You can't keep going back into cyclic actions of sin and think there won't be the same results of them. That's not what I'm preaching today, but I need you to understand that point. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I need you to understand. Cyclic actions are going to bring the same thing. So we found out that there was a famine, no doubt, not strange. God had his people in famine. So Elimelech, his sons Malon and Chilion, and his wife Naomi decided to go to Moab. They went over to Moab, which was a nice walk. When they got there, they found food. They had been there. Malon and Chilion got married to Orpah and Ruth. 
We found out that after being there 10 years, flourishing, that Elimelech died, which was Naomi's husband. Here's the tragedy. Both of her sons had found wives, and both of her sons died. Malon died. Tillian died. I don't know how I can paint this tragedy, but do you understand there was a woman who had just lost her husband and both of her sons all in a quick span, the Bible tells us. She was living in tragedy. She was living bad, and she was bitter and mad at God because of what happened to her. And if you look, it left Naomi, Ruth, and Oprah without, Orpah without any kind of support. In biblical times, in a patriarchal society, a male-driven society, women really had no way of protecting themselves except when they had a man, a male who was in the family, a father or a husband or a son, who was making sure that the women were taken care of because there were so many prohibitions on what women could do. And then she heard after this that the Lord had lifted the famine, and she said, I'm going to go back to Bethlehem, Judah, where we came from. So as she was about to leave, she turned to Oprah and she turned to Ruth and said, Hey, I need both of you to um, go on back to your mother's house, go back to your people. You don't need to stay with me. I'm going on back. So both of them said no. Well, Naomi started shouting to them. Look at the verse around chapter, verses 12 and 13. Look what Naomi said. Naomi looked at them and said, Hey, she said, Look, am I going to have another child? I'm too old to get a husband. And if I got a husband tonight, and we made a child. Are you going to wait around till they get old enough for you to marry them? She said, no, you need to leave me. You need to go. I cannot. Don't stay with me. The Lord has cursed me. I can't bear this. And all of a sudden, Orpah kissed her and left. Here's what the Bible says. Watch this. I need you to see this. Because the tragedy that she was facing was so strong, she could not face it. She was at the point where she wanted them to go. She was so lost, she didn't know where she was going. Listen to her language. Here's the part I have a problem with, and I need you to understand, I want to lift up. If God said that he would never put more on us than we can bear, I'm not trying to be unsympathetic to her, to her situation, but if God said he could put more on you than you can, would not put more on you than you can bear, why do you act like God doesn't know what he's doing? There's several people that have come to me and tell me, Lord, you must don't know what I can bear because I can't bear this. No, you're saying you can't bear this, but it doesn't mean you can't bear it. What it really means is if God doesn't put more on you than you can bear, it means when God put it on there, put it on you, or allow it to come on you, you should have been stronger. You had enough time to read the right word. You had enough time to get on your knees and pray the right prayer. You had enough time. I know it's not happy people, happy stuff for some folks. Can you write in the chat? I had enough time. And yet we found out she couldn't bear it. I remember I had a young lady in church who lost a child. And she wanted to end it all. I had another older woman in church who lost two children. She had been through it twice. Still holding up the bloodstained banner. So I decided for her to go talk to her. I said, I, you need to talk to her. I got her together. And to my amazement, she was only in there talking to her for 10 minutes. And I said, she came out, and I didn't want to, you know, was an older lady, I wanted to be respectful. I said, but so, so what did you tell her? She said, well, I listened. She cried. She told me all the problems. And when I heard what she was saying, I knew what the problem was. So I told her what helped me get through what I was going through. And when I go through it, she said, I told her, you must keep your hands in God's hands. I said, that's it. See it? You must keep your hands in God's hand. What she was saying, I, I didn't understand it then, but it was so profound. You must continually, every day, keep your hand, hands, keep yourself connected to God, and you will grow strong enough to be able to handle anything that comes in your life. She said, I've always done one thing. Keep my hand in God's hand. I made it do anything. Orpah left, but Ruth stayed, and Ruth told her. She said, here's, here's the statement. The statement that we all know that has blessed everyone. And it shows a loyalty that has not been surpassed. God placed it here so we can understand what real faith is. She said, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me. Be ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. First point in this text, keep moving back to God. Keep moving back to God. I'm going to show you how profound this text is and what Naomi did. 
albeit it's probably not have done it running, but it shows you the truth of strength. Strength is not this perfect life. Strength doesn't come clean. Sometimes strength is ugly. It's an ugly journey to strength. Amen, somebody. But strength, when it is embraced, will bless you. So here is the only bitter. We already read it. But she decided to go back to God. She could have stayed in Moab and mourned, but she decided to go back to her people. I understand this, but the strength that happens with Naomi right here is the blessing of me. It says that her name was Naomi. When she got into the town, everybody said, is this Naomi? Because she looked so bad. The name Naomi means pleasant. It means contented. It means joyful. But she didn't look pleasant and contented and joyful. She said, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Mara means bitter because the Lord is against me. I only say that point to tell you this. Even when she thought the Lord was against her, guess what she did? Kept going back to God. I want to tell you the first point to getting your strength back wherever you are is to make sure you keep going back to God. And, and since you go back to God, God knows how to change your life so that you look like what he calls you. Don't look like what people call you, but please look like what God calls you. Just like Naomi heard, pleasant, pleasant is coming, and then they looked up and saw what they saw. Sometimes the world say, here comes that Christian, here comes the Christian, but you don't look like a Christian. You don't act like a Christian. You don't act like God's child. You're depressed, you're sad, a depressed Christian. Constantly depressed Christian, we can all get depressed, is an oxymoronic statement. You came every Sunday when you watch it. I don't care if it's me or whatever preacher. Please don't come to every message with your head down. Are there any praisers in the house? Are there any fire starters in the house? Are there anybody who's down but said, when I woke up, if God gave me this morning and I can lift my hands, I'm going to praise him anyhow. Is there anybody that knows, no matter how bad my life is, i got to get back to Jesus. She said, I'm bitter, but she didn't stay there. She went back to God. Keep going back to God no matter how many times you fall. What am I saying? Joseph, a vessel of God, just like us, found himself hated by his brothers, sold into slavery, but he kept going back to God. When the Potiphar's happened, Lied on by Potiphar's wife, but he kept going back to God. Placed in prison for something he didn't do, but he kept going back to God. Left in prison after giving the baker and the butler the answers to their dream, the interpretation. They forgot about him and left him in prison, but he kept going back to God got out of prison, made second in charge of all Egypt, but he kept going back to God. His brothers came, and he could have been angry with them, but he, I'm, I'm trying to show you something. Joseph told us that out of all the things that happened to me, my success, my blessing was I kept going back to God, and he ended up saving his people from famine because Joseph said the secret, even when you're bitter, is to keep going back to God. Chapter 2, they were now broken. They're back in, in uh, Judah. They found themselves poor. So here, I want you to get the picture. Naomi and, and Ruth, I told you it was a, a patriarchal society. They had nothing, no protection. So Ruth decided, I'm going to go out and glean. Gleaning was when widowed or poor folk could go behind those who were reaping a harvest and pick up what was left. So they let poor people go, but you had to have permission to go to people's field. So Ruth said, I'm going to go and find out if there's someone who I can have favor with and will allow me to go to their field. Watch how God intervenes. She ended up in Boaz's field. When she got to Boaz's field, Boaz happened to come along. No coincidence. What am I trying to tell you? When you go back to God, God bless you to the point that good things happen. When she got to Boaz's field, Boaz came and he looked over there. She found favor. He walked over to her, to Ruth, and said, she bowed down. He said, look, you can now glean in my field, glean with my maidens, uh, and I'm a, you can just go behind them. You don't have to go to any other field, and I want the men to protect you. So she said, well, why are you being so, so nice to me, if I may ask my Lord? Why are you so favorable? And he said, I heard, watch this, guys. 
Your faithfulness opens a lot of doors. I heard how faithful you've been to your mother-in-law, how you left your people to serve God's people, and how you stayed with her even after her husband died, and your husband died. He said, so I'm going to bless you. And then he told her, he invited her over for a meal. And then he told his men, leave a little extra for her to pick up. She ended up going back home that evening with an E5. An E5 was a bushel of wheat that she had screamed. You shouldn't glean that much in one day behind the reapers. But she got it. And all of a sudden, Naomi said, well, where did that come from? And she said, it was God who, it was Boaz. And Boaz is one of our kinsmen Redeemers, Naomi said, our kinsmen, redeemers. She said, that is great. Make sure you don't go to any other field. Keep going over there where you are. Listen to the next thing that happened. In that 20th verse, we find out that Naomi now is finding herself better off. We see her Strength coming back. Because in the 20th verse she said, and Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, where did you reap that today? She said, bless be God. Wait a minute. Bitter people don't bless God. But the second point in the text is keep trusting God. He'll make a way out. I want to say that again. You must keep trusting God. He's going to make a way out. Naomi now found herself getting stronger. Here we have a destitute Naomi starting to believe God again and trust God again. Can I stop for one quick minute? Can you please right now tell your heart, tell your mind, tell your faith, tell your tears, I'm going to believe that God will continually make a way out. And the reason we believe that is because I want to tell somebody this and write it down. God has a plan for my life. And if the plan failed that I did before, I want you to write God has another plan. I want you to turn to somebody and tell them, even though that plan failed, God has another plan. It might be another plan to us, but it's only God's plan. God has a plan for our life. God always wants Wants to give us more. How many times has God opened the door for you and now you're forgetting about it because things are going wrong in your life? It reminds me of the story of the little girl who went to her father and said, I want a nickel. And the dad said, I don't have any change. And he was happy the girl asked him, so he went in his wallet and he poured out a $20 bill. He said, honey, I don't have a nickel, but I'm going to give you this 20 She started crying, I don't want that, I want a nickel. The dad tried to explain to her how many nickels were in the $20 bill. And she still didn't want to hear. She said, I want a nickel. The connection is, many times, our stubbornness, mm, we tell God what we want, and he's trying to give us more. You're sitting there asking for nickels, and God's trying to give you $20 bills. God said, if you learn to trust me when you can't see me, a blessing is coming. Oh, I saw somebody just wake up there. Trust me when you can't see me. You didn't make it this far not trusting me. Here's what God said. I can turn bad times around. I can give you good times. In the 22nd verse, I want you to see that plan, what he said. Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, daughter, that you go with the maidens and stay in that field. What she was saying, if you trust God when you can't see him, if you trust God's word, it is a blessing. Naomi started trusting God's word again. Remember the centurions who served and got sick? Wasn't a Jew, but he treated the Jews well. All the Jews said, can you please go plead to Jesus here? Jesus was coming and tell him my servant is sick. And when you get to him, tell him he needs to heal my servant. So they went. Told Jesus how good this man was. But when he heard Jesus was on the way, the man stopped and said to him, he said, uh, send a messenger. Tell Jesus, he don't have to come to my house. I'm not worthy of that. Just speak the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus heard this and said, I've not found so great a faith even in Israel. If you can understand how that delighted the heart of God, that this person who he knows he has the power can still trust him. When you sit there, pains, messed up, struggling, but you still say, write it down, I'm going to trust God. It lights up the heart of God, and it blesses you. Third point is text. Look, look, look at the crescendo. We go on to the third chapter. We find out in the third chapter everything unfolds. Naomi then, 
on the third verse says, I want you to do this, my daughter. And maybe God will bless you. I'm going to give you instructions because I want your life to be better. Can I stop? The third point to getting your strength back. The first point to getting your strength back is keep going back to God. Second point is trust God and he'll make a way out. The third point is keep your heart open to helping others. If you are the kind of person that all you think about is you, if all you've been thinking about is how this mess is going to get rid of your pain, I don't mind because you've got to get rid of yours, but you've got to know that one of the keys to getting rid of your pain is to make sure you keep your heart on the pain other folk are going through. Look at the chapter. He said, Naomi said, her mother-in-law said unto her, My daughter, I shall not seek rest until it is well with you. Have you ever done that? The greatest key to continual strength is to think of somebody else you can help. And God will bless you in your problems. He'll bless your mess if you learn how to smile, help, reach out to somebody else. What am I saying? That the key to that continual peace is when you say, I got to find me somebody to bless if your life is really bad this morning, I dare you to go out and find somebody, think about somebody you can bless, and watch how God takes that and uses that for an anointing that will bless you. There is an anointing in blessing other people that's so special that even Jesus himself used this anointing before he went to the cross. I know he went around opening blind eyes. Healing uh, the lame, and uh, I know he went around raising up the dead. I know he went around making the deep speak. I know he went around casting out devils. But do you know on the night that he was about to go to the cross, do you know what he did? He sat down to supper with his disciples, and after they had sat down and he watched this, it'll blow you away. Because that's not how we think when we get ready to go into some pain. I'm not thinking about that. I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to get through this. Jesus said, the text says, when supper was in, he got up, bent down, took the form of a servant, and washed their feet. How can the master wash his disciples' feet? Because that's the reality of that anointing. He knows that the real anointing in life comes when I give my life away. First, I give it away to God, then I give it away to others, then I make sure that my heart is focused on God. Naomi got her final test of strength back because she went to her daughter. When she saw all this happening, she could have just been worried about herself. She said, no, my daughter, I won't be right till you get there. Story ended. So she told him, you know, go uncover Boaz's feet in the threshing floor. Boaz had to sleep in the threshing floor, so the Bible still is weak. She went and slept there, and then when he, when he woke up, when he was startled, she said, I want you to be my kinsman redeemer. A kinsman redeemer is the next of kin. Whenever a male, it's a male who has whose family has lost another man who has protected them. That's why they call him a redeemer. And he must rescue that family by protecting them. And she looked at him and said, I want you to be my kinsman redeemer. And he said, I will be, but there's one who is ahead of me. Because it went in order. Are y'all with me? I know I said that fast. So a kinsman redeemer is the Greek word, the Hebrew word is goel, or it means a rescuer. I will protect you. So they slept together that night. He sent her home with um, a full basket. And Naomi said, let's just see what God will do. Is that the same Naomi that was bitter? I'm closing but she thought about somebody else. The fourth chapter opened with Boaz going to the other kids of Redeemer saying, you got to redeem Naomi, but you also have to redeem Ruth. And he said, I can't do that. That'll mess up my inheritance. He said, well, I will do it. He married Ruth and redeemed Naomi. And listen to the end of this book. Verse 14. And the woman said unto Naomi, blessed be the Lord, which has not left you without a kinsman that his name may be famous. All of a sudden, you didn't hear Mara or Bitter. Naomi was blessed, and the Bible says she grabbed the child and embraced the child, and the child's name was Obed, and it was a blessing because he was the grandfather or the father of Jesse, who was the father of David, who was in the line of Jesus Christ. What am I trying to tell you? If you keep going back to if you keep trusting that God can turn things around and make it better, if you keep your mind on helping someone else when they're in pain, you can go from being bitter. Don't call me pleasant. Call me bitter. Some of you are bitter out there, but God will turn your life around. Here is what Naomi said. When you call me pleasant, 
He restored her. He gave her mother years to live. And he gave her someone who could love her. Don't ever stop getting stronger. Come on. Rewind your life right now. Go back and say, I'm getting ready. Because God restored her. Gave her more life in her older years and younger years. And gave her somebody to love who was better than seven sons, the text says. How do you go from bitter to blessed? Keep on getting stronger. Don't stop. You haven't read enough. You haven't prayed enough. You haven't praised enough. But I declare, if you will, God can turn around your situation. If this message bless you. Put something in the chat. Write us. Let us know. Go to our, our um our page, our homepage, and you will find out there how to give to the ministry. You'll find out all the great things we're doing. But I'll tell you the truth. If you need, if you want the strength you need at the time you need it, don't stop. Keep getting stronger. God bless you. Take it to him and leave it there. I was down with the no way up and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but Living just existing well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free.